All right, guys. So thanks for coming, y'all. Um, appreciate everyone being here. Uh, looking forward to uh, talking today about evangelism and philosophy. So uh, you might wonder kind of like, what do you mean evangelism and philosophy? <laughs> What's all that about? Uh, well, by evangelism and philosophy, so I, I do have a book coming out um, probably sometime early next year with Cascade on an analytic theology of evangelism. And so I have a, a real interest in talking about evangelism, but kind of from a an an, more analytic point of view. Uh, and so I thought, well, how else can I get kind of people talking about evangelism, getting people interested in evangelism, especially from those of us who are more philosophically inclined? Um, and so, uh, well, I thought, why don't I go ahead and have further in Christendom uh, kind of host a forum where we could talk about that? And so... What I have here is I'm going to go through some slides where I'm going to briefly kind of give a theology and a philosophy of evangelism. So basically talk about what's the gospel, what is evangelization, uh, who's called to evangelize. We've got a kind of a few different thought experiments uh, for an argument that basically uh, all under normative conditions, all Christians are, are actually called and obligated to evangelize to at least some degree. Uh, and then uh, what I'm going to do is kind of transition from a little bit more of the theoretical to the practical. And so what I'm going to do is then I'm going to uh, offer up kind of practical real life situations on how to open up to talk about philosophy and to use that then to discuss uh, and share the gospel with other individuals. So a little bit of theoretical bit for the first part and then much more practical bits for the second part. All right. Um, feel free to interrupt me anytime, by the way. Um, this is supposed to be like a you know time of communication. After I do finish um, uh, all the slides, uh, I plan just to kind of open it up. Whatever you want to talk about, we could talk about philosophy and evangelism. We could talk about uh, something else. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Like what, you want to talk about God's existence. You want to talk about whatever. Um, uh, open up Q&A for, for that time. Uh, but again, feel free if you have any questions about what I'm saying or objections, you know, let's think through this together collectively. Uh, we can we can we can do that. All right. Let's go ahead and everyone can still see the next slide, right? First Corinthians 15 should be up. OK, great. Right. So uh, you might say, first off, like, what's the gospel? Right. When people think evangelization, they think in part, uh, you know, sharing the gospel, sharing the good news. Uh, so one might ask, like, what is the good news? What is the gospel? So I come from a Catholic tradition. What I'm going to say today uh, is obviously going to be consistent with my tradition, but it's also going to be applicable for my Protestant brothers and sisters as well. Uh, so, you know, sometimes you hear um, uh, certain Protestants will say something like, oh, Catholics believe a different gospel. Um, well, how I'm going to articulate the gospel today, what I mean by the gospel, I don't think there is a difference in how Protestants and Catholics think about the gospel, at least if we're talking about the gospel proper. Um, and so, you know, what is the gospel? Sometimes people in my tradition, uh, sometimes they'll confuse the gospel with, uh, let's say, building virtues or avoiding vices. Um, and, uh, you know, that that's something that, uh, you know, I want to avoid as well, right? I don't think that that is, is what the gospel is. It's not just about like becoming a better person or more virtuous person, right? Sometimes people in my tradition can confuse the gospel message with uh, uh, with basically Aristotelian ethics, right? That's not what I mean by the gospel, right? The gospel is a theological message. It's a historical message. Uh, and it's, it's, it's about reconciliation between um, uh, uh, God and man. And so, for, again, for those who are uh, just joining us now, feel free to interrupt me whenever you want. Um, feel free to, to this is a, a dialogue and so forth. At the end, though, we will be also doing Q&A. So uh, the first part is going to be more theoretical. The second part will be more um, um, practical stuff. So, all right. So 1 Corinthians 15, let's go to St. Paul. What does St. Paul actually say about the gospel, right? He actually defines the gospel for us. It's, it's, it's pretty neat. Uh, we don't really have to do too much debating, right? So uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, um, and you'll, you'll see the second part of this passage actually is uh, likely from an early tradition or, or early oral kerygma tradition that predates Paul as well. Usually it's dated within the first couple of years after the crucifixion. Um, Paul says, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received in which you stand, 
and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. And so here he's talking about the gospel, right? That's obviously what's being discussed. Now he's going to, to tell us what the gospel is. What has he been preaching, right? He's saying, I'm preaching the gospel, but now what, what is it that he's been preaching? For I delivered to you a first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, right? So it's all about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. When a Christian talks about the gospel, right? If we're talking about the gospel proper, right? We can use the gospel in, in like a loose sense, right? We can kind of talk about the gospel in, in really weak senses or, or whatever. But if we're really trying to get accurate about what we mean by the gospel, it's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for the forgiveness of sins, all right, uh, but don't just take Paul's word for it, right? What, what do we see when we're looking at um, uh, St. Peter, right, and his sermons? So if, if you go and you look, how does St. Peter preach the gospel, so to speak? Like we, We'd all say St. Peter obviously evangelizes in Acts. Uh, you look at Acts 2, uh, for example, the, the famous sermon with uh, uh, on Pentecost where the Spirit of God falls on everyone, and you see like the whole feature of speaking in tongues and, and whatnot, right? Uh, Peter in that sermon, right, the heart of his sermon before the spirit falls, before people speak in tongues, right? Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. And as yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed him by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it, right? So people are speaking in tongues. Everyone's kind of going crazy. What's going on? Peter gets up and he's like, hey guys, these people aren't drunk. Let me tell you what's going on here, right? And he he he, he tells them that they need uh, to uh, ultimately repent and be baptized, right? Repent and believe. And uh, the heart of his message that they're supposed to repent of is recognizing that Jesus died on the cross and he rose again for the forgiveness of sins, that he is the promised Messiah. Uh, and that he's done this death and resurrection so that the world can be made right, right? So the world can be reconciled. Um, again, Acts 10, Peter talking to the Gentiles, right? Um, he's preaching to the Gentiles now. This, and we are witnesses of all that he did both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him up on the third day and made him to appear, not all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. So again, central to his sermon in Acts 10, again, is the death and resurrection of Christ. So that's what we're seeing. We're seeing uh, you know, Paul lay out in First Corinthians 15, you know, it's, it's uh, the gospels, the, the message he's preached to everyone that he wants everyone to hold fast to, to stand firm with is the death, burial and resurrection. And again, we look at Peter's sermons and we see again, the central part of his sermons is in reference to the death and resurrection of the son of God. So that's what I mean by the gospel here. Also, again, I know not everyone is from my tradition, um, but uh, from my Catholic kind of point of view, um, even if you're not Catholic, you might still appreciate just kind of seeing what uh, our tradition says. Uh, here's Pope Paul. And he says, as the kernel and center of his good news, Christ proclaims salvation, this great gift of God, which is liberation from everything that oppresses man, uh, but which is above all liberation from sin and the evil one and the joy of knowing God and being known by him, of seeing him and being given over to him. All of this is begun during the life of Christ and definitely accomplished by his death and resurrection. So he's talking, talking about salvation. He's talking about being saved from the evil one, being saved from sin, right? Being saved from Satan. Um, all, all of this is kind of, it's, it's, it's definitively accomplished. Uh, it's definitively done through the death and resurrection of Jesus, right? That's the kernel, the center of the good news. Uh, so even again, Pope Paul, right? We're an encyclical, and he's he's saying this is the, the the heart of the gospel. This is the center of the gospel. All right, um, right. So, whoops, sorry. Um, 
So, you know, what is evangelism? There's an analytic theologian. His name is William Abraham. And uh, uh, he, he just passed, actually, a few a couple years ago. Um, if you haven't had a chance to read any of his work, uh, he was actually one of the uh, really founders uh, of the analytic theology movement. And so he's got a lot of work done on what he calls canonical theology, and he's he's got a whole series that he just finished, thank God, before he passed on divine action. Um, he's got some really important work. Well, he also um, has a book called The Logic of Evangelism. And the first few chapters are especially interesting. Uh, what he talks about, uh, he talks about, uh, you know, what is evangelism? How should we define evangelism? And he takes an approach that evangelism is that set of intentional activities, which is governed by the goal of initiating people into the kingdom of God for the first time, right? And so evangelism isn't just sharing the gospel, sharing the message of the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ to forgive sins and to, you know, save us from sin and Satan, right? It's not just uh, that. Right? That's that's the kernel. That's the heart of evangelization, right? That's that's in part what helps initiate people into the kingdom of God, right? That's like that's that's what's doing all the work there. But he takes a kind of a looser understanding of evangelization where evangelization is just kind of any activity that we do that has the goal or the purpose of getting people initiated into the kingdom of God for the first time, right? Uh, so what what this could be, this could be, that means like, like doing philosophy um, could be, you know, evangelization, right? Uh, doing philosophy could be evangelization if you're trying to use philosophy to Maybe help people see the rationality of theism or help pe people uh, uh, take the claims of Christianity seriously, right? So, I mean, doing philosophy or apologetics could be evangelization, right? Um, baptizing, right? Giving people their first sacraments. That's part of evangelization. Uh, uh, Billy even took the view that uh, kind of initially catechizing someone, right? Uh, initially uh, uh, teaching them what the Christian faith is. Uh, is about what it entails, maybe even uh, the moral, the the basic kind of morals of the Christian faith. So that's all part of evangelization as well. Uh, so the whole evangelization process, right, of is any activity that's kind of aimed at getting someone initiated into the kingdom of God, initiated into the Christian life, right? Uh, so that's this kind of a very broad view of, of evangelization. That's what I mean. I'm going to take that view of, in reference to evangelization, what I'm going to talk about. Um, so that's what evangelization is. And then, of course, what's really at the heart of evangelization is indeed sharing the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So hopefully so far, kind of in summary, you're you're kind of following what I mean by evangelization. You're following what I mean by, by uh, the gospel, right? Uh, now maybe we have, you, you can kind of share a similar framework with me as now we, we kind of ask the question, um, who is called to evangelize, right? Who is called to evangelize? So let's talk about this for a minute. Uh, here's a, a couple of different thought experiments that, that I give in, um, recent work to try to argue. I'm going to argue for the thesis that actually, uh, under normative circumstances, right? Under normal conditions, that all Christians are called to evangelize, right? They're all called to participate in this evangelization process, right? Maybe some people are called more to initiate first in contact with others. Some people, maybe they're they're called to, um, their evangelization that they're really focusing on is catechizing individuals, right? Or a priest, you know, delivering sacraments. Um, so it could be, you know, Lots of different roles people play, but I think under normative, uh, normal situation, normal circumstances, everyone is called to evangelize as long as you know you've been baptized. And so, um, you know, why think that? Okay, um, right. So you know, imagine um, there. I'm going to kind of go from the natural realm to then the, the supernatural realm. I'm going to give you these thought experiments. And again, feel free to interrupt anytime you want. Or, or if you want, you can save your objections for at the end. Um, right. Yeah, go ahead, Ray. Uh, when you talk about philosophizing as a way to evangelize, yes. do you think the, the, the previous uh, slide, when you talk about initiating people into the kingdom, yes. do you mean other people? Yes. If, 
Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Initiating people who aren't Christians, part of the Christian community, into the kingdom of God. Yeah. Yeah, because when sometimes when people philosophize, they they do it in solitude and the inquiry that they engage in, it's yeah, okay. That's right. Yeah. So not all philosophy obviously would be for evangelistic yeah. purposes, but the idea is that you could do some philosophy with the purposes of initiating people into the kingdom of God. Of course, apologetics that would be that's right. That would be. Exactly. Yeah. No. Good. Good. Good clarification. So, um, right. So imagine there's this guy. We'll call him Patrick, right? And uh, Patrick um is in a little village and uh he's let's say he's got some some uh some medicine oh we'll say some vaccinations or something right uh that he has in case people contract we'll call you know virus x right and this will will cure people of virus x and let's say virus x is like really deadly it's really bad a lot of sufferings involved Let's say that uh, you know Patrick has um, uh, the the antidote to for, for virus X. He's he's walking in the community. He sees I don't know. We'll call uh, some some girl. We'll call her Ireland, right? And uh, we'll say Ireland um, has virus X, and she's in agony. He sees she's in agony, uh, and he decides to not say anything about virus X, and he just kind of simply walks away and goes, oh, you know. Uh, that's that that's not good for her, you know. Wish her the best, um, and he's just gonna kind of keep uh, the antidote. Now let's we can imagine, right, that um, he, the medicine he's got an infinite number of 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 medicines. It's not like he's keeping his in order to like save his family or something in case they contract virus X, right? It's not like that. Let's say he's got plenty of of medicine here. Um, it seems like we would say no, no. He's obligated to give medicine X to. Um, or sorry, to give the medicine to combat virus X to Ireland, right? I think a lot of us have the intuition that like he'd be doing something wrong uh, as a human being if he didn't also give uh, uh, the the medicine to combat virus X to Ireland, right? Um, now, of course, you can like stipulate the situation where it's like, what if all of a sudden Patrick finds out his kids are drowning at home, <laughs> uh, or his kids have virus X and he needs to, to, to go to them immediately, right? In case, you know, he wants to stop their suffering, right? I mean, obviously there are all sorts of different scenarios where maybe we might think, okay, he's not obligated to, to give, uh, the medicine to, to combat virus X to, um, uh, Ireland. But I guess under normative uh, circumstances, it seems like there is some prima facie obligation that he gives uh, uh, the medicine to combat virus X for Ireland, that he shares that with Ireland. Um, now we can you know, kind of branch it spiritually as well, right? Um, so, you know, we can imagine, um, we can imagine that uh, uh, instead of virus X, Right. Instead of virus X, that uh, you know what what it is is nonetheless people are having like crazy existential crises. <laughs> They're like ah, you know uh, maybe they 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 want meaning in their life. Maybe they realize that if God exists, they're actually not right with God, um, and this really concerns them deeply, um, and they're in great existential pain, so to speak. Right. Um, well, let's imagine Patrick. Let's say Patrick is a Christian. Uh, Patrick goes to to church or mass regularly. He he prays on a daily basis. He has a relationship with the Lord. Um, he donates his time to help feed the poor. Um, you know he does good things. But Patrick is walking home one day and he runs into a female named Ireland. Ireland, who is told that she has weeks to live, is distraught about what will happen to her after she dies. As Patrick sees her in agony, he decides to ignore her and he moves on. Again, we would say that's not cool of Patrick, right? Like. Uh, moral goodness requires more of Patrick, right? Uh, it seems like we'd have the intuition that Christ, right? If Christ uh, uh, is as he is depicted in the Gospels, right? Christ demands more of us than, than simply going to Mass and, 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 and doing works of charity. Uh, in this case, that it seems like that Patrick ought to um, uh, talk with, with Ireland, right? Try to help her out. Again, assuming he's not under other constraints <laughs> in which, you know, might muddy the waters here, right? Um, well, now let's imagine that um, he doesn't know who it is, but let's just say that he knows that dozens of people, as he's 
walking around his village are in agony. And they're in the same situation as Ireland is in. Um, he doesn't know who they are, but nonetheless, um, he knows that there are plenty of people around him that uh, are going through this kind of struggle. It seems like, again, he's obligated to, at least on occasion, strive to have conversations with people that he's around in order that he uh, might meet someone who is in this situation so that he can offer them a solution uh, or a response to their problems. Right. Even with like, uh, let's let's imagine that the, the, again, we'll go back to the drug example. Um, if it's a virus, maybe he doesn't know who has the virus, but he knows that lots of people around him have a virus. Uh, maybe he's not obligated. Maybe he can't because he's got family obligations and he's got work obligations. So, you know, maybe he can't just constantly go around all day long asking people if they have the virus. Right. Uh, but it seems like appropriate that he has some obligation to strike up conversations with people on occasion. And if they have the virus, uh, then he he's going to provide the antidote. Right. It seems like that that's that's reasonable. Uh, the, 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 that uh, to interpret that there's some prima facie obligation on Patrick to do this. And so same thing spiritually, it seems like uh, the same thing could be said uh, that he has some prima facie obligation to uh, try to intentionally talk with people uh, to see where they're at spiritually and if they need uh, you know the, the gospel, if they need the antidote uh, to what they're going through to these you know crises. Um, so anyway, to me, I think these types of thought experiments, uh, thought experiments lead me to think that indeed um, uh, it seems plausible that all Christians are called to evangelization, at least to some degree, given their various circumstances and, and walks of, uh, of life and that sort of thing. Um, again, from my Catholic tradition, uh, the command, this is Pope Paul again, the command to the Twelve to go out and proclaim the good news is also valid for all Christians. So it's not just something for the apostles, uh, though in a different way, all Christians are called to the witness. And in this way, witness, they can be real evangelizers. We are thinking especially of the responsibility to incumbent uh, incumbent on immigrants and the countries that, re that receive them. So special uh, emphasis there. But uh, nonetheless, you, you, you see that according to Catholic social teaching, Catholic tradition, um, this is a, a call for all Christians. It's not just something for the uh, apostles, right? It's part of the Christian faith. Um, all right. So this is kind of going to, you know, in summary of this kind of more theoretical part of, of the discussion, right? Um, again, the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And uh, there, uh, this message is there so people can be initiated into the kingdom of God as a larger part of this evangelism measure, uh, which is, again is aimed at any kind of uh, initiating intentional activities to get people into the kingdom of God. Um, and this idea that we're all Christians, right, are called to evangelize to some degree in some way because, hey, not only has the Pope said it, but here, think about these thought experiments that might make this kind of plausible uh, in your mind. Um, so it's not just for, like, uh, fundamentalists. It's not just for, uh, you know, Protestants. It's not just for um, the apostles or priests or bishops. Um, it's, it's, it's for everyone, so to speak. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, so if I understood you correctly, the, yeah. th there's the moral obligation to charity if yes. we, we if we share the intuition here. Mm -hmm. that if if it is the case, then is the is that moral obligation prior to even evangelism or posterior to evangelism? Are we committed to the moral obligation of charity only in Christ? Or because when you I could see that you you can do with the the thought experiment. Yes. As opposed to treat someone that's yeah. yeah yeah so so yeah so yeah okay yeah no that's really that's a really good question a really good question um right so uh, what I would what I would say is that baptism basically kind of like uh, qualifies an individual um though i don't even think you have to be baptized to 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 give the medicine so to speak but it's kind of like official qualification. Uh, obviously, there's circumstances which who cares about the obligation? You just go for the remedy if, if that's what's needed for the situation. Um, but that, uh, yeah, um, that maybe there are special duties. So maybe it's like a case of overdetermination, right? Uh, maybe it's 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 prior in reference to charity. 
Um, but upon being baptized, there are like additional and sufficient obligations now also on you that, you know, are in reference to, to um, uh, those who have been baptized, that they also have these obligations as well. So um, maybe a case of overdetermination. Uh, that's what I would th think about. Well, at least, well, yeah. Uh, well, to think in terms of duty and, and you yes. Yeah, that's, that's, but well, it's very interesting to, to, if there indeed is someone that's in existential crisis. That's right. About what happens after death and you ignore that person. That's, that what what when you talk about a practical part, I, I will I will see what what would come up. I mean, in, yeah. in real life, that's uh, the well, yeah. So it's not that often that we met someone who mm. has not yet encountered Christian faith. Mm. It, in a way that I have to approach that person. That, right. That's what I'm. What, uh, what I'm uh, struggling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's a great question. Um, so. From my so I've I've been doing like evangelization before I even got into philosophy. In fact, I got into philosophy because I thought it was like a really cool tool that could help um, with the project of evangelization. Um, uh, so cool that I, I went ahead and got a PhD in it. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is great. Um, it's a way to love God with your mind and to love your neighbor as yourself. I think. Um, but uh, so I, I've been doing evangelization for a long time. Um, and a lot of times, you're right, a lot of people, no matter where I've lived, right, whether it be America or when I lived in the UK or when I lived in uh, China, right, um, a, lot, a lot of people have some at least very vague, basic idea of Christianity, right? Um, probably a little less so um, in, say, like the mainland of China, <laughs> as opposed to, you know, say, Texas in America. But uh, nonetheless, um, you know, you still have that. Um, however, I think people have pieces of information about the gospel, but they, 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 a lot of people haven't sort of put it together collectively um, to kind of understand like, oh, so it is God who, who, who becomes man according to Christianity, not just like um, this really cool guy or this prophet or, or uh, you know, an angel. Um, and, oh, he dies on the cross because we've sinned and oh he he raises to life and in the same way that he's ra risen we too can be raised if if you know we turn from our sins and, and and believe in the gospel or turn from our sins and be baptized um and so kind of putting all this together oftentimes is really what the job is doing it's not kind of so much giving new information but it's putting all this kind of together and then also bringing up a, a time to reconsider, right? A lot of times it's in the back of our minds. We hear about it. We think about it maybe on, on rare occasions. Um, but it's it's also kind of another time to say, hey, just a friendly reminder, right? Um, <laughs> we're all going to die. <laughs> um, you know, what, what are your thoughts on this? Maybe it's a good time to reconsider these things, uh, reemphasize kind of things that you've already thought about previously. And who knows, it could be that you're going through a whole bunch of different other circumstances, other conditions that you've never gone through before. And all of a sudden, this time, when it's going to become a current in your mind, uh, when it's going to become more explicit in your mind, you're going to think about it differently than you have in the past, right? So, um, and, and what I stress on is uh, I like to do philosophy before I present the gospel. Uh, and so here's kind of how this done. And so that way, when I'm encountering people, especially like, say, when I lived in the UK, um, I was encountering people who were like second and third generation atheists, which is like really foreign to America. Usually in America, if you're an atheist, you're like the first person in your family to be an atheist. Right. Um, and so but in the UK, it, it wasn't like that. It was more secularized. Um, and of course, you know, certain parts of the world, if there's a political party that dominates and requires everyone to be atheists to be part of that political party, right? Obviously, is, you're going to have more generations of atheists than 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 not. Um, and so uh, what I try to do is I try to give them, before I kind of talk about the gospel, is to articulate a vision uh, that makes God plausible, that makes the resurrection of Christ plausible. And so now that I've done that, maybe now when I reiterate the gospel or very briefly kind of put all the parts together, right, maybe now they're going to take it more seriously. 
And I, I do also have kind of a theology that um, I think there's kind of power in preaching the gospel, that the, that the Holy Spirit works um, with the preaching of the gospel to where maybe even if I suck at presenting whatever I'm presenting, maybe God would, would still work in that. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to transition to the practical, though I see James' hand uh, raised, I'm going to transition to the practical and kind of talk about how I think this can be done in a way that respects the other person. It doesn't violate ethics <laughs> um, in a way that uh, is plausible and, and in a way that I think is not doesn't come off too fundamentalist. Um, James, what, what are you going to say? I'll actually hold off because I think okay. my question may be answered in this next section. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So um, when, when we're talking about evangelism, we can talk about different contexts of evangelism, right? Uh, I want to talk about specifically three different contexts for evangelism. One is just going to be kind of like in natural settings um, that you just find yourself in. Um, so it might be like you're at a bookstore and you're sitting down reading and you see someone else is sitting down reading and you strike up a conversation with them. Or it could be you're on a plane. And uh, oftentimes, if you fly a lot, right, you realize that maybe you're going to speak a word to the other person sitting next to you. Um uh, and they're, they're going to ask you something or you're going to ask them something. And then all of a sudden, next thing, you know, you're talking about, um, uh, you know, what do you do for a living? Right. And so I, I actually think the, what do you do for a living question is, is really helpful, even for non-philosophers. So obviously if you're a philosopher or you're a grad student in philosophy, um, this will be really easy for you. Right. Uh, but even if you're not a philosopher, uh, I, I have another way of going about this. Um, so what you can do is you can say, oh, what do you do for a living? Oh, that's what you do. You know, OK, F find what they're talking about. Right. What they do for a living. Maybe ask them some questions. Um, and then naturally they're going to ask you or maybe you want to volunteer what you do for a living. And so what I'll say is, yeah, I'm a philosopher. Um, you know, and I'll say like, hey, did you have any philosophy classes uh, ever? You know, did you go to college, take philosophy or take philosophy in high school, maybe? Um, and, uh, you know, see kind of what they say. And then I would say, okay, well, um, I specifically, I like to think about God and if God exists. And so like, there's like these arguments in philosophy, maybe you're aware of them, maybe you're not, I don't know, um, that, uh, try to establish th with a conclusion that God exists. For example, you know, here's my favorite one. And, you know, I'm really big on why is there something rather than nothing, right? Um, and so, uh, not, not a huge fan of, uh, not, not thinking real about, um, uh, not a huge fan of kind of alternative accounts of metaphysics that make it such that, um, uh, that the universe is necessary or, um, that the laws of nature or initial conditions of the big bang are necessary or that sort of thing. So I really find compelling personally, this is just kind of my own biographical information. <laughs> uh, I really find compelling uh, the question, why is there something rather than nothing, especially when we apply it to the universe, you know, why does the universe exist when it doesn't have to? So that's kind of how I would start off the conversation. Uh, I would say, yeah, I'm a, these are the sort of questions I like to think about. Like, why does the universe exist when the universe doesn't have to exist, right? Um, and so there's this argument that says, and then I explain the argument, right? I explain the argument uh, that, you know, if, if the universe doesn't have to exist and needs some sort of explanation and, you know, that explanation of, of the space-time continuum, uh, if, if, if it's not going to be a circular explanation, right, it's going to be an explanation that's outside of space, time, et cetera. And I kind of ex go, go explain that uh, to them and say, no, so I, th I think God's, you know, um, a, a good explanation for why the universe uh, is when it doesn't have to be. And then I just kind of like pause, like, what do you think about that? And then they talk to me about what they think about that. Um, if they seem to like affirmative, like, oh, that's interesting. I never thought about that. I've, I've had lots of times where this has occurred. Uh, I've never even heard there were arguments for God's existence. What do you mean? This is really fascinating. Uh, and then what I do is I say, okay, yeah, but there are even arguments for like specifically Christianity. And so those of you who are familiar with like William Craig's work on the resurrection or Michael Kona and T. Wright, that sort of thing, I'll usually then say, okay, so if God does exist, let's, let's put that as part of our background knowledge. You know, here's what most New Testament historians will say, and I'll give them the facts and I'll explain why these facts are the case they are. And I'll say, I think the best explanation is that God raised Jesus from the dead. Um, and then what I'll do is when I say that, I'll then lead to the gospel. 
very kind of briefly. And I'll say, yeah, and that's the whole point. God raised from the dead, right? Jesus raised from the dead because we humans we suck. <laughs> we don't do things uh, that we're supposed to at times. We don't love everyone as we should. Um, and this makes us at odds with each other and odds with God. But that's why God became man and did love his neighbor as himself and did love God the Father as himself to the point where he died on the cross and rose again. And that action really pleased God the Father so much that you know he raised Jesus from the dead and in doing so is making everything in the world right again. And so that's, that's the whole point of the gospel. Uh, that's the whole point of his resurrection. And then I'll just be like, and those who turn from their sins and trust in him, those who turn from their sins and are baptized, right? They're tied to Jesus. They're they're just as Jesus will be risen, they'll be risen, right? And I'll just kind of explain it that way. Um, and then usually like maybe they'll have questions, they'll have objections oftentimes. But what about evil or what about other religions or what about whatever? Uh, and that's when I then share from my theological perspective, right? So I'm a Catholic that's uh, very committed to Vatican II and, uh, you know, documents like Lumen Gentium and Ad Gentes. So I have a very uh, um, optimistic view of other religions and, and and a very charitable view of other religions and truth found in other religions. So I'd go about, you know, answering their questions from that perspective or, or, or whatnot. Um, and it's, 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 even if you're not um, a philosopher, you can still do something like this where you say, oh, well, I'm uh, technically by trade. <laughs> I'm a um, auto mechanic or uh, IT uh, or I'm uh, a teacher or I'm whatever. But really, my my like one of my main interests is actually in philosophy, um, uh, specifically like arguments for God's existence. And then you could just be like, oh, so for example, this is argument that says X Y Z, right? And then boom, you've just you transition in the same way that I would transition as a philosopher, right? Um, so anyway, that's, that's, um, how I would, um, handle that situation, right? Um, that's one way you can kind of handle one-on-one -on -one evangelism. Um, all right. Uh, James, go ahead. Hey, I, I really appreciate that, Tyler. I agree with everything you said there. This is more so a question so that I can better understand the rationale for your presentation, yeah, which yeah, I yeah. completely agreed with. Uh, but that is, was, 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 did you intentionally um, leave atonement theories ambiguous? That is to say in the presentation, it wasn't like, you know, like something that's a hundred percent consistent with PSA or ransom theory, et cetera. Um, and, and if so, um, why is that approach better than like the standard YouTube method where someone goes up to someone and says, have you ever told a lie? And so right. Forth. Yeah. So a couple of different things. Um, so what I said, I, I do think it's consistent with PSA, uh, penal substitution uh, theory of atonement. Um, I, but you're right. It doesn't uh, entail it, nor does it entail most other theories. It's just like a very bare minimal substitutionary model. Um, and uh, it might be that in certain, certain cases, I give more details about the atonement. But in other cases, I might just keep it kind of simple, especially if it's just kind of like a quick conversation on the plane or at the bookstore. Um, uh, part of me doing that is because I'm trying to kind of give the bare minimal. And from a Catholic perspective, right? Um, uh, there is no kind of official theory of atonement. <laughs> um, the bare minimal is basically you got to believe in some type of substitutionary uh, theory with like the idea that love is really what's motivating the atonement and motivating Christ becoming man, God becoming man and that sort of thing. So um, a little bit practical because it's just kind of shorter. It's, 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 it's brief, uh, especially in a casual conversation. Um, but another aspect too, because I'm just kind of interested in the bare minimal um, that doesn't, if, if, if uh, there might be context, however, where they're like, but how does the resurrection, how does the atonement of Christ save sin? Uh, then I might give more uh, explicit view of uh, the atonement. So. Thanks. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you, Mr. West. Um, all right. Um, all right. So here's a, a different type of, type of context. Uh, evangelization in an intentional setting, right? So here's a picture of um, St. Paul Street Evangelism, um, their ministry in America, where they basically, what they do is they they have tracts, they have rosaries, they've got crosses, right? Maybe some statues, they put it on a table and uh, they invite people to come and uh, to their table, come over, right? And then maybe they have medals and they'll just hand them out and say, would you like one of these, right? 
And so people are walking by. So you set up a table, people are walking by and you might just take a couple steps away from the table and say, hey, would you like one of these? We're giving these out. And oftentimes they might say, well, what's this? Or sure, right? Um, and then you would say, okay, so do you have a religious background? Uh, what do you believe about God? Um, and then you're able to uh, all of a sudden start that conversation. Well, I don't believe in God. Well, uh, here's an argument for God's existence. Maybe you've never heard of this. And you give them an argument for God's existence, right? Um, uh, you know, maybe they say, oh, I believe in God, but I don't really know much else, right? Well, then you talk about the resurrection evidence and you give them the gospel, right? Um, and so you can kind of do the same thing we talked about uh, with the first presentation, but you kind of are a little bit more upfront about it. You're, you're, you, the, the transition is immediately religious because you're handing out religious um, objects. And so maybe uh, if you want to go evangelizing, maybe you just get a couple people from your parish or from your church and uh, you do something like this. Even if you're Protestant, you can like set up a table with crosses and New Testaments and, you know, whatever, uh, and do the same sort of thing. Um, and so I've, I've done this I've, uh, on campus, on different campuses as well. Um, but yeah, anyway, that's kind of uh, that idea. And then there's also open air preaching. Um, so this is uh, where um, you, you might get up and just all of a sudden you find a hot, some high ground, get up and say, all of a sudden just belch out arguments for God's existence. Right? <laughs> uh, everything that begins to exist has a cause. Premise two, right? The universe began to exist. Therefore, three, the universe has a cause, right? And then all of a sudden, when you just start belching out uh, premises of an argument, people are all of a sudden just like, look at you like, what is going on, right? They're used to hearing street preachers, at least in certain parts of the, in the West, right? They're used to hearing street preachers. Uh, even, even when I was staying in Korea, they were actually, we, we ran into some street preachers. Um, uh, I stayed in Korea for, for a while. Um, so even not just the West, like a lot of people are, are familiar with street preachers, um, but they're, they're used to kind of individuals coming at it from a very fundamentalist, uh, very kind of, I'm going to beat you over the head with a Bible type uh, attitude. And so when all of, a, all of a sudden you start like going at it with philosophy, people are like, what? Right. And so what I would do is I would explain the argument and then all of a sudden I would transition that to the gospel. So I'd say, so if God does exist, would you be right with God? Um, it seems like, no, we wouldn't be right with God because, you know, we suck as human beings, right? Uh, we lie, we steal, um, you know, we don't honor and love each other as we should. We don't honor and love God as we should, right? Um, but that's the whole point of the gospel is that, and then you explain the gospel, right? And so, uh, you know, uh, when it when it comes to, to this sort of thing, then you can just go and repeat. Then after you explain the gospel, you all of a sudden give a different argument. As a reformed epistemologist, I could be like, if God exists, we can know he exists, right? Uh, but if atheism is true, we couldn't even know that atheism is true, right? I might explain kind of a Plantigian approach that he gives in knowledge of God, right, to, to Michael Tooley. Um, and then again, I would say, but so if God does exist, are we right with him, right? I always kind of come back to that and then, then present the gospel. And the, the best tip I have for open-air preaching is that uh, the second uh, you get someone to ask you a question or the second someone objects to you, like engage them. What do you mean by that? And like, someone's like, oh, uh, um, it's flying spaghetti monster, right? uh, or, uh, uh, oh, Christianity was just made up by people trying to control people or yeah, right. If God exists, why, why all the evil? Right. And then you just engage, like stop what you're doing, whatever you're saying, and just immediately engage them. What do you mean by that? Let them talk, let them give their perspective, uh, understand their perspective, uh, you know, love them by understanding their perspective. And then you can answer the question. And then I promise you, the second one person stops and starts conversating with you, you will get swarmed by people, right? I've been in this setting and I've, uh, it happens every time. <laughs> um, like literally, I think every single time I've ever done this. Uh, and you, it might be five, 10 people, 20 people. Sometimes I've had upwards near 100 people just circled listening. And then after you're answering these objections from one person, all of a sudden someone else has a, uh, an objection and they're willing to to engage with you about that objection. And then you're just kind of going from person to person as you continue to reiterate the gospel after you answer uh, the questions of, of individuals. So anyway, here are three different ways to kind of practical ways where you can share the gospel. Uh, these aren't the only ways, um, but indeed that is what I have for us today. So again, hopefully from the talk, you got the theoretical bits, 
Um, and, and also now the second part, the kind of the practical, but it's actually implementing this. So uh, any questions, objections, um, anything anyone wants to say? Ray, go ahead. Uh, just <clears throat> so uh, philosophizing is more than some intellectual challenge, I think, because from what you've shared, how you would evangelize on a plane when you talk yeah. with someone else, that when, when you, well, usually when when I learn evangelizing, it, it starts with the gospel instead of arguments from mm. theologians, that especially analytic theologians or bringing science. That's that's not how we are taught to do that. Yeah, but I think that that's that's a very uh, that that puts things in perspective because how we uh, through doing philosophy we can help spread the word. That's uh, right. Of, that, that's uh, that just I, I mean in practice what you did what what yeah. you what you would, would uh, ju it because you would have a um a focus what you yeah. Uh, when you do your theoretical part. So I think that's uh, very, I, I, learned, I learned something today. Yeah, yeah no, that, that thanks for sharing. Um, yeah, uh, and especially like being in a place where it's not most people are Christians. Um, I find, you know, that, that to be really helpful. Um, yeah, the yeah. number matter, yeah, because it's it's not, it, it takes up a, a lesser uh, proportion than those people that know the properties of God, how they are, uh, uh, um at least the, the goodness hmm. aspect is is uh that they, they should know more. <laughs> that, that, yeah. I agree. Yeah, that's right. Um James. Hey boss, I have a few, so bear with me. Yeah, yeah um, go ahead. So you mentioned you spent a lot of time thinking about this, and admittedly, I haven't. So I'm curious, in your research, have you stumbled upon any innovative uh, technological advances insofar as evangelism is concerned, like some neat apps or something that integrates technology with the proclamation of, of the kingdom of God? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, sadly, I, I haven't really, I mean, there there is an app um, uh, I, that I know, I don't know if it still exists, this was years ago, um, that it had the gospel in various different languages and the person could just mm. kind of interactively click on answers if you didn't speak that person's language. Uh, I mean, there's something like that. I mean, nowadays, I probably wouldn't even use that. I probably would just um, uh, stick with like maybe using Google Translate. That's what I did all the time in China when I was living there. Um, if someone didn't speak English, uh, given that my Cantonese was uh, ever improving and, and not not great. <laughs> um uh, not, not, not very much, um, you know, just kind of sticking with like Google translate and usually people are really happy to read and respond back. And, you know, there's, um, some, a little familiarity with English maybe. Um, but yeah, uh, I think, you know, there are some people who have different websites, like apologetic websites, um, mm -hmm. that are pretty interactive. Um, so, you know, Chad McIntosh has a list of a whole bunch of arguments for God's existence. Um, there was a one website I'm trying to remember who it was by that basically um, did Bayes probability for you for, for God's <laughs> existence. Uh, I don't know if it was my friend Colin Miller, maybe's website, or um, I think maybe Josh Rasmussen might even have one or have those involved in one. So yeah, I mean, the, those sorts of things. Um, I find social through social media, especially um, sharing William Lane Craig's cartoon videos uh, quite helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't agree with him on everything, but I think the contingency video is pretty good. And so I'll, I'll, I'll send that to, to people sometimes, um, the fine tuning one as well. Um, so anyway, that, that, that's the best I got for you for tech technology. That's good. Now that, that's helpful. Maybe a project for the future will be kind of getting all these websites and links in one centralized place. Um, That'd be good. Yeah. So I so this is more so me approaching you as if you're and I'm sorry if I'm taking the floor from anyone else no, has questions ahead. just let me know. Um. So, okay. So in this scenario, I'm kind of approaching you as a consultant, and this is a real world scenario. Yeah. Um. We live in a rural area that has about three hundred new homes being built, and across the street of our neighborhood is a church, the church mm -hmm. I go to, and I'm trying to find the best method to approach evangelizing my neighborhood um i was considering the old-fashioned 
door to door evangelism. But right. a majority of my neighbors have signs saying, <laughs> like <laughs> asking people not to knock on their door. Yeah. So yeah. I wanted to just pick your brain. What tips do you have so we can remain faithful in this right. moral imperative that we have, um, but also do it in a way that we don't become the enemies of our neighborhood? Right. Take people off and stuff. Yeah. yeah. What I would suggest is, um, uh, one of two things, either one, if your area has events on occasions, um, uh, maybe a little festival or maybe um, some sort of, I remember even when I lived in like small towns, I, currently I live in small town, um, uh, before where they would have like once a year, maybe they would mm -hmm. have uh, little things where people would have like little booths or put up art or would um advertise for their business or something like that so maybe going if you're if your area has something like that um and then kind of just going with a table and uh, bringing new testaments and gospel tracts and so forth and trying to talk with people that way giving out crosses or whatnot and so you're still reaching the people in that area uh, without going to their houses right um, so that's one way. And another way to do it, even if there isn't like a festival that happens on occasion or something like that, uh, it might be, uh, there might be some place in your area that's okay with you kind of putting up a table, um, with doing this kind of approach. And so maybe occasionally doing that in your area would also be a way to reach those people without going to their doors. So anyway, that, that's, those would be the two, two options I would think. That's great. Yeah. I wrote those down. I'm definitely going to, uh, look more into that. Last question. Um, what are the next steps? You talk to someone, you evangelize them, they seem receptive. What's the next step? Is it, hey, let's go grab lunch? Or is it more so, hey, come to church or to mm -hmm. mass on Sunday? Like, how should we approach that? Yeah, so what I do is, if it's a good conversation, um, uh, what I'll say, so if, if they're Catholic, um, I'll say, Hey, well, have you been to confession in a while? You know, this church over here, like I'll, I'll figure out the church, the parish in my area. Mm -hmm. And I'll be like, yeah, you know, they, they do confessions at this time, or, um, you know, I encourage you to, to, to go, or if I can have a priest with me, you know, they might just be able to do it then and there. Um, but I always are, I'm willing to give my contact information. So either mm, oh, cool. uh, what I usually do is social media, because typically everyone has social media and, it's um, a lot less personal than like an <laughs> an email or a phone number. And so I'll just say, hey, are you on are you on social media? Are you on Facebook? Feel free to add me. I, I, I don't like say add me right now, but you know, just kind of <laughs> give them that option where if they mm -hmm. want it to continue that conversation, they could uh, they could do so. So anyway, that, that's how I would do that. Cool. Perfect. Um, that, yeah. Go and ahead. Then, did anyone else have anything? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hey, Tyler. So uh, it's Moses. Uh, and I think uh, it's really great uh, that you share so generously about some tips uh, about how you can go about evangelism. And it's even more remarkable, uh, you know, given that uh, the tips that you give, uh, they reach this Catholic and uh, Protestant uh, divide uh, mm -hmm. in the sense that they are very general. Right, so regardless of whether you are Catholic or whether you are Protestant, you know, uh, these are some of the things uh, that mm. you could consider doing. And I found that to be uh, really cool, right? Um, but uh, perhaps it's my own philosophical uh, tendencies. But uh, I do have uh, I I do hope that some of these suggestions are uh, you know they work. Uh, and personally. I take a more indirect uh, approach to evangelism. Mm. So uh, I've been very lucky to be offered uh, you know, uh, a rather long-term uh, teaching contract uh, at mm. the National University of Singapore teaching mm. uh, introductory philosophy That's and awesome. logic yeah. courses. Uh, and I've been teaching philosophy uh, as soon as I've graduated mm. you know, from my bachelor's degree. And it has been about four to five years and uh, <clears throat> the kind of way I'm trying to evangelize uh, isn't really to, you know, throw these arguments, you know, in the face of students, right? Mm. But really, uh, you know, if it is a class on the problem of evil, right, uh, it would be to ensure that the atheist uh, has a fair hearing, right? Um, if it is, uh, you know, a class, right, on ethics, right, it is to not be overly dogmatic 
about mm. you know Christian morality and mm. I think so far I have many students uh coming up to me mm. right uh telling asking me hey you know uh why is it that uh you are uh Christian, you know, when you are a philosopher, I thought philosophers, they are supposed to be critical thinkers, you know, yeah, they are supposed yeah. to be intelligent people. So why, why is a philosopher Christian, right? Uh, at least for me, uh, I'm not very ambitious, right? So, so long as my students, uh, you know, they, they, they encounter, they have this question and they want to talk to me about it, uh, which many students, uh, you know, they do. Uh, I do consider myself uh, successful, you know, uh, yeah, in, yeah. In, in, in sharing the gospel. And some of my students, uh, they went on to complete, uh, you know, the initiation journey. So the Roman Catholic uh, initiation yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for adults, right? So they, they completed it. And, uh, you know, so uh, I, I'm very happy that, uh, you know, so this kind of indirect uh, method, right. you know, uh, could work as well. And my own aversion to a very direct approach, uh, has 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 been that um uh I've seen it fail uh on my on my parents because uh before I became a Catholic uh my entire family uh you know uh, I I am the only uh, Protestant in my entire family and my family is Buddhist right so mm. my Protestant friends uh they would uh you know invite my whole family over to their house uh for a dinner and although I realized that they are very hospitable. But the, the issue is that um, these people have been uh, just, you know, basically, uh, you know, uh, trying to, uh, you know, dumb, you know, the gospel. It's like a brain dump, you know, of the entire gospel text, uh, Protestant theology and what they believe, mm -hmm. uh, you know, onto my parents, right? So uh, I've never found, uh, you know, such an approach working and, uh, you know, uh, my my Protestant friends, uh, they continue to bombard my parents with messages. Mm. Uh, even when my parents do not reply, uh, <laughs> to the extent that uh, my parents they ask me, uh, why why are your friends uh, mm. like this, right? And I often wonder, uh, re really, is it because uh, you know, Protestants, right? They 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 have this view that uh, salvation is uh, you know. Some, some protesters have this view that uh, salvation uh, it is entirely an affair you know of, of God you know uh, yes you have to give us irresistible grace right so it doesn't really matter what I do right so sometimes I wonder you know if this is the, the reason uh, you know why uh, sometimes mm. uh, you know we we bombard uh, you know others with uh, the gospel so much so that actually uh, we forget that uh, less is more right? So no, I think uh, that, that yeah. there's there's definitely important wisdom there. So like, for example, if I end up sharing the gospel with a friend or with a neighbor or something like that, um, I don't just keep going back to it unless they come to me and they want to talk about it. Um, my job is to kind of initially basically share a few things, tell them I'm a resource, I'm open, right? Um, but I, I don't like keep going back like, oh, so did you think, you know, you, you convert yet? You convert yet? You convert yet? You know, uh, why haven't you converted yet? You know, um, so I, I do think that that's important. And in the way that I'm, I present the gospel oftentimes, like I imagine that a lot of times it doesn't even feel like I'm preaching at them so much as I'm kind of explaining something and then, you know, leaving it open for them to, to, to respond. Um, so I think that's also pretty important. Um, uh, but yeah, like in, I've taught in secular institutions as well and just kind of giving theism a fair trial, uh, fair, a, a fair representation. Uh, I had students coming up to me saying, I had no idea that there were arguments for God's existence. Um, you know, can you tell me more about this? Um, and so, you know, they'd come to me after class and, and, and ask these things, um, just because, I, in class, I wanted to make sure I, you know, I had a, had a cross on when I taught and I'm going to, uh, without violating any ethical considerations, I'm going to, you know, give the arguments for atheism, give the arguments for theism, um, and, uh, give, give theism a fair representation. And, and that actually was pretty impactful. Um, so yeah, I definitely want to agree on that. Right. Uh, so uh, Tyler, actually, uh, thank you so much. Uh, you know, uh, I haven't actually asked any question yet because uh, evangelism is actually a topic very, very close to my heart. And uh, it actually is why I have chose to become a philosophy academic uh, in the first place uh, mm. without 
uh, I mean, if it's not for evangelism uh, like you, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't have taken this path. But uh, I'm going to be very short and concise now. Uh, mm. So my question to you, uh, there are a couple of questions, right? So the first is uh, today, uh, nowadays, uh, Christians uh, or people who have, uh, you know, people are aware, you know, that Christians, uh, they exist. And, uh, but Christians, uh, they disagree on mm. a lot of things. And uh, one, one, one disagreement between, you know, say maybe Catholic and Protestants, right, is on, you know, whether, you know, faith alone uh, mm. is sufficient uh, for salvation. Now, um, evangelism, uh, you know, is important, uh, is urgent. Uh, and why is it urgent? Well, it's precisely because of, uh, you know, the virus uh, analogy uh, mm. that you have given. So now this 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 thing, uh, I wouldn't consider it something that, you know, we should just uh, bracket because mm. uh, there are Protestants uh, who, who think that, uh, you know, works are not necessary at all you know uh, for salvation uh and there are you know christians uh catholics uh who think that this is important now if i were to approach uh you know a uh you know uh a non-believer who have heard you know a variety of uh different views mm -hmm. and has gotten a pretty bad impression you know of christians at the same time because maybe they christians you know uh, they do not just tend to be misunderstood, but uh, you know, some of them can can give people a very some of them can leave a very bad uh, reputation. So, uh, how are we supposed to be effective, uh, you know, evangelists uh, in this day and age, uh, you know, and you know, be you know, really Christians who are worth killing and Christians who are you know really worth the worth their salt, you know, instead of being you know Christians who start meaningless cultural wars or start meaningless uh, arguments and you know like that. So so. In, in light of how you know how how many different Christian denominations and different Christians views are you know there are how 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 can we uh, you know try how can we be effective you know mm -hmm. in evangelizing uh, you know, even when there's so much disagreement you know, yeah. in, in the situation that I shared with you. Yeah. No, that's a good question. Um, so actually what what one of the chapters in this book that I'm talking about that's um with Cascade. Um, I actually look at like the um, justification, the doctrine of justification, and I actually argue that like a lot of the disagreements and debates um, are uh, built on equivocations, um, and uh, that there actually is, is um, uh, very consistent Protestant ways of thinking about justification that are consistent with Catholic ways and so forth, um, and so like even like with Trent and and anathematizing certain views. Uh, once you find out how Trent is defining, say, faith as just purely mental assent and not as trust, which is used for faith, hope, and charity, um, all of a sudden, a lot of the 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 issues um, um, go away. Um, and so, finding that common denominator, uh, I think, is really helpful. Uh, a common denominator that obviously doesn't conflict with one's own tradition. And so, uh, and that, this is my approach that I have with other religious traditions as well. Um, so, you know, I, I've um, some work on Buddhism, especially lately, uh, trying to show consistency with classical theism. Um, and that's kind of the, it's a similar sort of approach that I take. Uh, so I think finding common ground, the more you can kind of uh, agree on and, and look at the other person and seeing that they have truth um, and that, you know, they have uh, 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 they don't need to completely just shift and change every, the way they're thinking about everything and throw away all their you know, prior beliefs and so forth. Um, yeah, I think, I think that that's, that's quite helpful and just kind of correcting like, Oh, actually, no, you don't have to completely like jettison your views that that's consistent with what I'm saying, kind of showing the more, the more consistent stuff, I think the better, obviously there will come a time where there might be some disagreement where you can't say that's consistent with, but I think the more you can, the better. And I think Catholic theology reflects this, uh, where in agentes, you know, we see that God is a secret presence and other traditions, um, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, all truth is 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 from the the spirit, and uh, you know, from the author of life, and uh, that anything that's true and holy in other traditions um, are are true and holy, uh, and they can be found in other traditions. So, I think taking that approach 
is really helpful and will oftentimes from a bad experience they've had with other people might go, oh, this this is you know much better. I appreciate this much more than you know previous experiences and whatnot. But, um, right. Thank you so much. Yeah, and then we'll close it out here with Ray. Ray, what you got for me? Yeah, uh, I wonder whether the following is a way of evangelizing because I'm thinking of instead of uh, stressing salvation and afterlife. Uh, because that sometimes I think I I feel that it, one would instrumentalize one's faith and in effect in, with the effect of having a counterfeit faith because you Jesus died for our sin and mm -hmm. if we talk about morality uh, mm -hmm. of course we don't like to, we 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 the preachers used to moralize but now we try at least in 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 the local church in, in here in Hong Kong, they, they try to tune down the tone tone mm. down the you don't you can't do that, you shouldn't do that. But then if morality and sin, if we can find a, the uh theological notion of sin and commonsensical secular morality, if we can find something that's a uh that we 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 can have have have, have a way of communication that mm -hmm. we because we're like the good Samaritan. It's not about afterlife, and Jesus talks about the, those that go for life will lose their life, and it, it, so I I, I, I would uh, I would focus on the morality part, mm. and, and because usually when when we learn about uh, the Old Testament in in a uh, Protestant setting mm. is that we are separated from God, and we um, Eve and uh, Adam used to be immortal and now they will have to work and they will die mm. and that's that's what we learn about sin right, and right. and th th that's a a byproduct that's if i well I, i'm a protestant but i i do want to learn more about the um how do you call that lean yoke uh, 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 and purg purgatory mm. purgatory yeah, yeah yeah so so you could be more uh, well it, <laughs> During your lifetime, you are someone, I, I guess, upright and moral, but then there will be some trying times after you die, right? Mm -hmm. And that, that the, the judgment day, that's Pope. So because Protestant would believe in whether you have turned to Christ before your death, mm -hmm. that, that makes a difference to whether you go to heaven or not. So th th these are notions that I think uh, uh, Protestant are to, to, to know more from mm -hmm. Catholic mm -hmm. and and the moralizing part and the sin part, instead of trying to convince someone about some things supernatural, I think that's mm. the word. That's yeah, so yeah, yeah. So I, I, if that's still evangelizing, I, I wonder what what you think because that that'll be something that I, I, I would need less equip equipping. Yeah, to, to do, yeah. yeah. So, you know, if, if it's part of a, a, a if, if, if indeed on the definition that I gave, right, if it's uh, you're taking intentional actions, uh, this, this strategy to talk to them in this way um, about about morality or whatever uh, is in hopes that they would become in the kingdom of God. Right. Then then it seems like you are evangelizing in that sense. Um, but then just kind of realizing that ultimately what they're going to need, either by you or by someone else is indeed to to hear that gospel message or to um yeah so anyway that would be my take on that yeah, but were it be that easy i i would i wish it would be that easy yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well th thanks guys for coming appreciate you all and uh i will definitely see y'all around um through social media or whatnot so god bless y'all